Say I've got this laser pointer, I uh, point it up at the sky, uh, there is no roof in the way, there is no air. In the absence of it actually hitting anything, how far will that light reach? So if you don't think my laser, little laser pointer is powerful enough, we can say, okay, the light from our sun, how far is that going to reach? Or the light from our galaxy, how far is that going to reach? Will it reach an infinite distance or will it only travel a finite distance? Okay, so I'm going to try and uh, go through uh, the limitations of what we can see and, and if there are any. Um, okay, so, uh, s very simple space-time diagram to start with. You have time going this way, you have distance going this way. Uh, this is us in the centre, this is our world line. Uh, these are, say, different galaxies. They're world lines at certain distances from us. This is a very boring, non-expanding universe. Um, I've start made an uh, initial time here. Uh, and the way that light travels through here is along a light cone. So in non-expanding space, you know, light travels at 45 degrees. Um, so what this this is us now. So every um, point on this diagram is an event, a position in space and time. So this is our current event right now, blink. Um, and so the past light cone is everything that we can see right now. So we're seeing this galaxy as it was at that point in time. We were seeing this galaxy at the very, very beginning of the universe. So this is what we can see right now. Note that uh, it's not, if we drew a horizontal line through, that's, that's the current time everywhere, so that's the dt equals zero, um, but that's uh, not what we see. This shaded in area uh, are all the events that we can possibly have seen already. So these are the, event, uh, the events that we can have seen in the past. Now, I've made an imaginary end to time in this particular fake little universe. Uh, and if there was an end to time, then we would have an event horizon. So this event horizon is the light cone at the end of time. It's, and that limits the events that we can ever possibly see from the events that we will never be able to see. Uh, so you can see some interesting things in this plot here. So this, if this is the present day in a horizontal line here, you can see that this galaxy here, for example, we have just started to be able to see it, but it's already outside our event horizon. So we will never see it as it is at the present day. Um, this one we is with within our event horizon, but will soon pass out of it. Um, and yeah, so there, there's whether you can see something now uh, is not related to whether you can. Is, not the same as whether you can see something as it is now. <coughs> okay, so uh, there's another horizon that is often used when describing the universe, and that's the particle horizon. So it's different from the event horizon, it's sort of actually the inverse. The particle horizon is the distance to the most distant object that we can currently see. Uh, so you can see, for example, that at the present day, the most distant object that we can currently see is this one. We see that object as it was here. So we've emitted the light there, we see it now. And so that's why the particle horizon is like the, um, the mirror image of the past light cone. Uh, and so we see that, that object as it was in the past. And so at any particular time, the objects that we can see are the objects that are within our particle horizon. Okay? So let's put this on an actual real picture of the universe. Uh, so here is uh, the universe that we think we actually live in. This is a universe that has 30% of the critical density, uh, where the critical density is the amount needed to have the uh, universe flat. Um, the 30% is in the form of matter. That includes both normal matter and dark matter. 70% uh, is in the form of dark energy, uh, specifically a cosmological constant. Uh, so this is observation, observationally about the favoured model that we have of the universe at the moment. Uh, I've drawn this in co-moving distance. So this is uh, the chi here, just multiplied by the current size of the universe to get it into um, uh, units. And so here is 20 billion light years away. Uh, this is us again, the central object. Here's the uh, um, us right now, the blue line is dt equals zero, that's a constant time slice. And this light cone is now no longer straight, it actually curves in these coordinates. 
again, these are, I've, I've actually labeled galaxies here. This is a galaxy that's a redshift of one at the present day, this world line here. And remember, it's in co-moving distance, so the expansion of the universe has been divided out. So that's why they're, all of these are straight lines. Redshift three, redshift one, redshift a thousand. Uh, and an object with redshift infinity would be at our part of the horizon. And our part of the horizon is the green dotted line. So you can see redshift of infinity would be at something there. And um, so what, what you're actually seeing here is it's not that the rate has changed, it's just simply the size of the universe has changed. So here you've got two uh, galaxies separated by a co-moving distance of like, that's 10, so you know, 12 um, billion light years. So at that, that's in co-moving distance. Once you add in the scale factor, this early part of the universe, those two galaxies were actually really close together because the universe was much smaller. Uh, so two co-moving galaxies were once very close together. So it doesn't take very long for light to travel between that small distance here. But a co-moving distance of about the same now, it takes light half the age of the universe to get to us. And it's simply just because the, um, the galaxies are further apart now. So it's getting more and more difficult to send light to different galaxies as they get further away. Here we get back to this question that I asked you before, how, light can, how far can light eventually travel? And to answer that question, what you need to do is, there's no end of time in this particular universe. We, this um, this amount, amount of matter and dark energy means the universe will expand forever, uh, barring catastrophes, phase changes, whatever else could possibly go on that we haven't think, thought about. If everything stays the same, it will expand forever. But So what you do is, if you take this the tip of this light cone and you pull it up to t equals infinity. So you stretch that light cone up to time equals infinity. If that expanded in such a way that it enveloped every single galaxy, you would then you would be able to communicate with every galaxy eventually. But it doesn't. If you pull this up to time of equals infinity, what you end up with is the event horizon which I've coloured yellow in this one. Uh, so here is your past light cone at the end of time, where now time is time equals infinity. And the, you can see that this event horizon uh, is well and, well and truly there. And just like in that pre previous plot, you can see that this galaxy, which is at a redshift of three, which is actually not that high a redshift given our current observational capabilities, um, it uh, has already crossed the event horizon. So we're seeing it as it was about you know, two or three uh, billion years after the Big Bang. So we're just seeing that now. Um, but it's already past our event horizon, so we will never be able to communicate with it. We can't send a light beam to it. We'll never see it as it is at the present day, and it will never see us. So there is a limit to how far we can see. In fact, the event horizon right now is at a redshift of about 1.7, uh, which is actually pretty close to us. Um, this is what the Hubble Space Telescope sees if you look at nothing. It was with director's time on the Hubble Space Telescope uh, and what they did was they took Hubble, they pointed at a blank patch of sky. And they pointed at a blank patch of sky for 10 days. Uh, and this is what you see when you look at nothing. And basically everything in here, except a couple of little stars, um, are all galaxies. And the most distant galaxies that have been identified in this picture are um, out at sort of a redshift above six and a half, with some even higher ones proposed. So if you look at the little dots in the background here, heaps of them are beyond our event horizon. So lots of the dots that you're seeing there are galaxies that we will never be able to communicate with. They're beyond our event horizon. And uh, in fact, the majority of the, the dots are there. If you have us here and a galaxy here that's proceeding um, faster than the speed of light, it sends a light beam in our direction because it's in, uh, you just add those velocities linearly, the light is attempting to travel towards us, but it's actually getting pulled away. So it actually is, in, in these distance coordinates, it's actually moving further away from us over time. So it would sound, seem intuitive to say that if something's receding faster than the speed of light, then we will never see it. And it's not quite true. And the reason is, I've drawn here the Hubble sphere. This is something I haven't mentioned yet. The Hubble sphere is um, the sphere with the radius of the Hubble distance, where the Hubble distance is just C on H. So if you had the, before we had velocity, 
Is that okay? Yeah, is uh, Hubble's constant times distance. Um, if we make that equal to C, then the Hubble distance is just C on H. Um, and so that's what I've shown here. And you can see that initially, the Hubble sphere in co-moving distance actually, actually gets bigger. Because initially, this universe was decelerating. So initially, that, uh, that expands. You see a turnaround at a particular point at where we start to accelerate, and then the Hubble sphere starts shrinking. And it's this shrinking Hubble sphere that event, when we, there's no matter left, basically the matter density is diminished to be approximately zero, then you have this, this Hubble sphere um, actually does move in uh, and you end up with the event horizon and the Hubble sphere being coincident. So in the infinite future, yes, you, the Hubble sphere, the limit at which something is receding at the speed of light, is the, our event horizon. But in the early universe, that's not the case uh, because we're de decelerating and or even not accelerating at an exponential rate or not expanding at an exponential rate. Okay, so let me introduce the, the curve, the expansion of space back into this diagram. And this is the final thing that, uh, final diagram like this I, I want to show. Um, and this has some really interesting features. Look what's happened to our light cone. The light cone now is a teardrop shape. And this is describing what I was just showing what I was just describing, the light being dragged away from us because it's in a region of space that's receding faster than the speed of light. So what happens is you can see that the Hubble, the Hubble sphere here, again, this light that's following this light cone here actually starts very close to us. So this is when people ask, okay, so you have a, um, you know, the, the entire observable universe was once contained in something, you know, the size of a tennis ball. Uh, and uh, we're only just now seeing all of that stuff. How is it that it didn't take uh, the, a minuscule fraction of a second for light to travel across that te tennis ball and, and us to see it? The reason is, reason is that tennis ball is receding, uh, is expanding so quickly that light, even emitted this far away from us, gets dragged away, and it took um, several billion years to eventually reach us. So that's sort of a, a, a strange conundrum. Um, and so what light does is it uh, follows this sort of um, teardrop light, light cone. You can see the point at which it passes from outside to inside the Hubble sphere is the point where the light goes from receding from us to approaching us. So that's the, that's the turnaround point. Um, but apart from that, you can now see that the, the galaxies are all doing their expansion thing. Um, the event horizon eventually asymptotes at a fixed distance. That's in the specific case where we end up with exponential expansion, which is what you get if you just have a purely cosmological constant dominated universe. So you end up having a fixed distance to the things that you can see. Um, again, remember, this is all coordinate dependent. The way that we describe things is coordinate dependent. And this is when you draw the, um, that same diagram, but in uh, conformal coordinates, where you've taken the scale factor out the front, then everything turns out where you have light cones that are straight lines, uh, and it all looks a lot more special relativistic. Uh, doesn't, that doesn't change the observability of anything, it just, just changes the coordinates that you've used to describe it. And you can see that the conformal time um, is actually finite. In conformal time there is an end to the universe. Even with infinite coordinate time, in, co in conformal time there is an actual end. And so uh, that's because the time coordinate that goes in here has a one on R factor in it. So, I'd like to make the analogy now with the black hole and how this works with the black hole. Because uh, in many ways our universe actually ends up looking like an inside out black hole. Uh, so, what do we know about a black hole's event horizon? What happens if you emit light from near a, a black hole's event horizon? I'm sitting just outside the black hole's event horizon and I send a light beam out. What happens to it? So, so there's a, it's a, basically a gravitational redshift there's a time dilation associated with that. So if something's hovering here, uh, it, the time is vastly stretched compared to what you have out there. Um, and you basically, you, things redshift into unobservability. So if you have something that's falling into a black hole, um, as, it, as it falls, uh, it gets more and more redshifted. If it's an astronaut that's flicking a laser pointer on and shining it at you once every second, that laser pointer will reach you once every two seconds, once every four seconds, and get longer and longer. Uh, and you will never see that astronaut fall over the event horizon. They will just 
end up, because of the time dilation, they'll appear to freeze on, on the horizon. But because of the red shifting and the, the time dilation, the number of photons and the energy of those photons is dropping so much that they fade and you eventually lose sight of them. So you, you can't actually see them frozen there. They, they fade into unobservability. Uh, so exactly the same thing ha is happening from what I just described. So if you look at the, in, for the cosmological event horizon, if this is us at the centre, uh, and this is one of our friend galaxies who just happens to be sitting near our event horizon, uh, what we see is, or what they see, uh, is basically um, the equivalent to ours. So because it's homogeneous, you actually get the uh, basically the same, and it, a bit, rather than having like a black hole with one point where you have uh, a event horizon around it, you have everybody has their own event horizon in the universe. Um, so they might be on the edge of our event horizon and we're on the edge of their event horizon. At the moment that's about 15 billion light years in the universe that we think we live in. Um, and exactly the same thing happens. Light is being redshifted, the, we call it the cosmological redshift, but it's, you're basically seeing the same thing. Those galaxies are getting time dilated, uh, so things take longer on those galaxies, and we actually measured that and observed that with time dilation of supernovae over uh, cosmic time. So supernovae brighten and fade over the course of about a month. We watched it, you know, it takes a month. If we watch nearby ones, it takes two months if we watch ones that are at a redshift of one. And so we quantified that and measured the time dilation of the, due to the expansion of the universe, which hopefully uh, stops people from claiming that the redshifts that we're seeing aren't due to expansion. There's people keep claiming there's things like tired light or something like that, where for some reason photons are losing energy, and it's not because of velocity, it's not because of expansion, it's for some other reason. And so in order to try and uh, convince people that that's not the case, that expansion is really there, you we've observed this time dilation. Uh, and to polish off the bit about which universes do have event horizons, here's a plot of uh, the cosmological constant versus omega m going in this direction. Uh, and here you have spatially closed, flat, and open universes. Above this line, you have above the blue line, you have um, universes that expand forever. These ones you have universes that collapse, including this little corner down there, those are collapsing universes, even though there's an accelerating component to them. Uh, and anything up there, um, so if you have a positive cosmological constant, any universe that's eternally expanding uh, and accelerating has an event horizon. And if you don't, if you're not eternally expanding, if you're recollapsing, or if uh, you're not accelerating, then you don't have an event horizon. So that's a, a pretty much as complete an answer as I can give to, to that. Thanks.